Welcome to Old Path and our study through the New Testament. As we uh, progress through it, we get to the book of 1 John. We start that today. And uh, same John that wrote the gospel. And I'm, I want to kind of drill down on that a little bit. We're only going to get through the first four verses of this today. But um, when, you, when you get to, um, a lot of times you'll do Bible studies. And depending on who's teaching them, they'll go into a, a lot of the background of what there, there might be known about it. Uh, with Paul's epistles a lot of times since they're written to very specific locations um, it's a little bit easier to to kind of come back to the history part of it in this case this is referred to as a general epistle and John writes it to those that he refers to as children and um, these are people that that of course mean a great deal to him so there is a a belief in um, some circles within Christianity that we should be preaching John's, uh, um, Paul's gospel. And uh, they try to make it as though there's something that Paul teaches that's different from what you see elsewhere in the scriptures. And what they, they tend to just forget is sometimes audience makes a, a big deal, a big difference in this. So when Paul's writing, oftentimes he's writing to, yeah, it would be the church, but it's also among the Gentiles. And uh, the audience is very, very mixed. Uh, a lot of times Paul will talk about what are the essentials of the gospel and um, some of the people there are either in the need of convincing or it's helpful to them in how they are to conduct the uh, the world uh, themselves in the world and what the message should be. In the general epistles, especially the ones that we've looked at so far, James and the, and the two epistles that Peter had written, it's written very specifically to established believers. And uh, so the idea of going through the elementary parts of the gospel is not as, as prevalent as you might find in Paul's writings, uh, though you can find it without too much trouble. It's not as though they have different gospels or different beliefs, different uh, good news, if you will. The audience, are just, they're just different. So here with John, it's very similar to what we see with James and Peter. If it wasn't for the fact that they understood what the gospel was, and it's almost offensive to think somehow that Paul had a better edge on how to how to preach the quote gospel, uh, considering that when it comes to uh, James and John's and uh, John and Peter, uh, they were eyewitnesses to the things that they saw and they they knew what it was that they had uh, that they had heard, and so it's not as though Paul was some Johnny come lately. Clearly, he knew a great deal. Um, very, very heavily invested in the Old Testament, and he would have known who Jesus was clearly at the time, um, because he was there at the he was in a place of great prominence by uh, Acts chapter seven and Acts chapter nine in the infancy of the church. So it's not as though he got saved at some much further down the road uh, time, not knowing much about who Jesus was. He was just an adversary at the time. So again, it's just really important that we understand this. When we come to, say, John's writing here, John, um, when you compare his gospel to the, this, this epistle, and we'll take a look at that, because I want to look at the, the beginning uh, parts of, of his, his gospel. If I look at his gospel, I think of it in terms of something that's written very much in a theological, I don't want to quite call it academic, because academic writings can tend to be a little bit, you know, on the... They're so laborious, they're so, they're so focused on language or whatnot, but it's, it's meant to give a very thoughtful, very uh, thorough examination of the deity of Jesus. So John looks to do that in almost the academic sense. So he deals with theological parts of Jesus that you just don't find dealt with elsewhere. By the time that we get to John's first epistle, it is very similar in its wording, and you see in these first few verses, very similar to the gospel. But the rest of this gospel, he's going to then end up spelling out the Jesus that he knows on the personal level. So he first of all presents him in the gospel as the God who created all things and then who became flesh and dwelt among us. So that we get, and it sets the tone for the rest of that theological work. Here, John is writing to people about the Jesus that he knows, that they know as well, but it's said in a way of a bunch of reassurance that, they, that he intends for them to know and to understand. Uh, what we're going to find here is that this book has a heavy, heavy emphasis on love, and I'll get to that in just a moment. But uh, what we want to do is, is get to, um, uh, to the Gospel of John to begin this today. And uh, we're going to just, without a whole lot of commentary, read through the first 14 or so verses of that. And we're going to look at it 
because we'll be able to compare it to what we see in 1 John in this epistle and some of the similarities that are there, but it's, again, presented in, in such a way that it's almost academic in the gospel, but it's very personalized here in this epistle, and this is what he wants them to understand. The Jesus that I spoke about in my gospel, I want to tell you about him on a personal level as one who knows him, and we want you to know him in the same way. So, um, really, really masterful the way that the Holy Spirit leads him to do this. And uh, again, you know, when we start to think about themes and, and stuff that we see in the text, start turning with me, if you will, to uh, to First John. It's, um, or I'm sorry, to John the Gospel, and we'll come back to First John. But in John the Gospel, um, the, there is an importance that we understand who Jesus is in the most fundamental and, and basic of ways. But uh, then to make him knowable and understand who he is and why that matters uh, in, the, in the epistle is why you see he's written the way that he's written. So in John 1, um, let's get there. And you're going to find that um, the, the topic of love is dealt with uh, heavily in the gospel and uh, for God so loved the world that we know that passage really well. But as we work our way through the epistle, um, you're going to find that love is also just a major, major topic that is presented there as well. And so I'm trying to talk and turn to John at the same time. So John chapter 1, let's get there. And uh, when it comes to this matter of love, when John writes what he does in the gospel, he writes it for the intent, for the sake of the readers, that they would understand that uh, God loves them on the personal level, like we see in chapter 3. God loved the, the world that he gave his only begotten son. So that's an action. That's the verb. God loved in the verb sense. When we get to the, the epistles, um, when it comes to the matter of love, there is, you can either say the, the word love or agape, that's used 18 times in, in 1 John, a five-chapter book. And the first mention is not even until we get to chapter 2. So it's not even mentioned in the first chapter. In the next four chapters, he's going to use the word agape as the noun, the description of the kind or the quality of love, which we'll be talking, with, uh, talking about a whole lot as we go through the study. But then there's another 17 times that he speaks of love as an action or a verb. So a total then at that point of 35 times in four chapters, he's either going to speak about love as what it is and as, as a noun, as a thing, or when it's put into practice either by God towards us or us towards others or our love towards him. So you can just see he's wanting us to learn from the one that he learned from. And so in this case, Jesus, the one who is has uh, personified love and and has shown what it is to John. John's wanting that to be known to the rest of us. So um, turning to John, the gospel, chapter one, let's have a word of prayer and uh, let's go ahead and tackle the text. Father, we thank you so much for the time that we can spend in your word. We are grateful that you have preserved it for us all these years and uh, that the things, even as we get into the epistle, the things that, that uh, John preserves in, in uh, his writing to the people, uh, probably, as I've said so many times with the other, the other writers, not expecting that 2,000 years later we'd still be reading their words. But we ask, Lord, that you would help us in our understanding of what we read and why does it matter? How do we make application to us? And so we give you all thanks that you have preserved it for us, and we pray that by the Spirit you would help us in our understanding that we might uh, grow in our knowledge of you. And we give you all thanks and praise in Jesus' name. All right, so there's very similar wording, not only in the, if you would think about it like as a concept, but there's very similar wording when it comes to um, more of... Uh, of the, the actual language that is used, and it's deliberate. So it's pretty obvious to pick that out. Now let's uh, just look at chapter 1, verse 1. So in the beginning was the Word, and, and uh, when you see that word, it's capitalized. The word there is logos. So there is there's the words. Sorry, I'm having a problem with my glasses today. I'm going to change them out to these ones. They're more comfortable. Um, there is the, the, the word in Greek is logos. And so you can have the word like words on a page. Logos has a different 
uh, kind of a feeling to it because it goes more to the intention of what should be known or what should be said. It's what what's the thought behind it. Now, when you have the person of Jesus, he is actually then at that place the personification of the intention. Everything that God would want to have known, all you need to do is see his son and hear him speak, and you'll have known to you the intention of God. What does he want for you to know? He's going to communicate directly to us. In fact, you find that in the in the opening verses of the book of Hebrews, that God, God spoke to the fathers in a number of different ways in, the, in times past. But in these last days, he has spoken to us directly in his son or through his son. So that same type of understanding is also found here. It's going to be, uh, as we read through 1 John, the same kind of a thing, that God has desired to communicate directly with mankind. And so it's not just some booming voice from heaven through the clouds. It is, although he's done that in times past, and he's spoken directly to prophets, he's given to them visions, he's done this in a variety of different ways. But again, as Hebrews captures it so very well, he is now in human form, taken on a body of flesh and blood, that he is able then to communicate directly with mankind. The intent, everything that God would want to have known, is found in him personified, in a human, in a human form. So in the beginning, we read this in the gospel, in the beginning, that's the beginning of all of creation, before time, before the, the creation of the universe, before anything was, Jesus was there. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. So there in, in proximity, if you will, he was there present with the Father, as, we're, as he says, with God. He's trying to make sure that we understand the, the personal distinctions here. So he was there in the beginning with God, and the Word was also in the essential part. He was also God. So Father, Son, and Spirit. People say that the, the Trinity is not, not uh, taught in the Scripture because you don't find the word Trinity, but you certainly find the usage of it here. So he's trying to make sure that we understand this. This language is so important, and it is absolutely in keeping with what you find in Genesis because that's the other in the beginning kind of a passage. So the Gospel of John says in the beginning. The, God, or the book of Genesis says in the beginning. And if the beginning was just one, you know, one God with not in, in three persons, it would be a different word in the Hebrew, but it is Elohim in the Hebrew, which is intended to be a noun that has plural usages. More than one could use it. And so in this case with Elohim, it is intended to, prete uh, to present to us a God who can be manifested in more than one person, but essentially they are one. And the context varies. So the context you will find at times, you'll even hear, hear Elohim applied to uh, humans because they're in a place of being in great authority or judges. Um, so there's places that you'll find that. But most of the time when you see Elohim in the Old Testament, it's the word that you would use of God, but in a way that you could understand. Could it be God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit? These are things that they didn't fully grasp in the Old Testament because Jesus had not yet been revealed to us. He was very much a mysterious figure to them because he was, an, he was pre uh, presented as an angel, but no ordinary angel because he would receive worship. And he would speak about things as though he was God and not just one of the creation. So he's a different person there. In the New Testament, we understand who he is because he's presented to us as a distinct person, God in the flesh, who set aside his eternal state to become flesh and blood among us. He didn't stop being God, but he confined himself to a flesh and blood body, which is exactly what John says here, and it's what he will re-emphasize when he gets to his epistle. So let's get to that. Let's read on. In the beginning was the Word, speaking of Jesus, the Logos, and the Logos, the, the Word, was God, and the Word Logos was God. So that, that gives to us his distinction is deity. In verse 2, he was in the beginning with God. Once again, re-emphasizing his proximity to God before anything was. So the proximity not as a separate, but that he was present, for better for our understanding, he was present with the Father before all things um, were made, and he was present with the Spirit also who was present. Only three of them could have qualified for being in that place before anything was made because they're the only ones who essentially share the same, uh, the same, um, I, I just use the word essence. 
What is it that makes them who they are? Are they all powerful, all knowing, all present, everywhere they could be all at once? Every, they are, they're the only ones who could ever claim all of those kinds of things. Even the greatest of the angels, Lucifer, is not all knowing. He's not everywhere at one time. He's not all powerful. That is reserved for God alone, manifested in the Father, Son, and the Spirit. They're the only ones who share those attributes and those characteristics, though they are separate personages doing different things. So, in verse 3 it says, Now all things were made through him, and Jesus is the, is the topic here, remember? So, all things were made through him, that means that Jesus was the agent by which God created things. So, through him and without him, without Jesus, nothing was made that was made. In him was life, and that life was the light of men. He's going to pick up on that in 1 John. We'll, we'll look at that uh, when we get there. And that light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. Now, there was a man sent from God whose name was John, that being John the Baptist, prophesied in Isaiah chapter 40 that he would be the one. He even reemphasizes that himself by saying, no, I'm not the Messiah. I'm the one that Isaiah spoke of, making straight the way of the Lord. So this man came as a witness to bear witness of that light and that all believe through uh, that all through him might believe. And he was not the light. John the Baptist was not the light, but he was sent to bear witness of that light. John the Baptist was there to point the way to Jesus, the light of the world. Jesus uses the same terminology in his I am's here in John's gospel in chapter 8. I am the light of the world, one of his seven I am statements, which means it is he and no one else who could claim it. And he's when it comes to enlightening, lighting things up or enlightening things or making them illuminated, he's the personification of that and no one else can claim that. So it says that, speaking of Jesus, was the true light, which gives light to every man coming into the world. Now that's potential. It's there for everyone, should they choose to, to accept it. He will light, he will, he will make those things illuminated to you. You will leave darkness and walk in light. John is going to be talking about that very topic in the first chapter. We'll get into that next week as we start to look through the text more. So it says, he was in the world, speaking of Jesus, Jesus was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. That's why we can look back at chapter 3 when it says that all things were created through him. Well, is that speaking of the Father, or is that speaking through, about the Son? Who's the topic? Who's the subject? Well, this settles it right here. He was in the world, the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. That's speaking of Jesus because he came to be a part of it. He came to his own, and his own did not receive him. But as many as did receive him, he gave to them the right to become the children of God, to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Important part, because we're going to get to this also in his epistle. There are those who claim to be Christian in our world today who mock the idea of a personal relationship with Jesus, or that it's a matter of the heart. Because they've heard the slogan and the bumper sticker, have you accepted Jesus into your heart? And they, they find that to be, you know, almost laughable and like a bumper sticker kind of a thing. And yet, it is a matter of the heart. That's where one receives to, to the matter of belief. And that's covered in, uh, in Romans chapter 10, that with the mouth, I'm sorry, that with the heart one believes unto salvation. And with the mouth, uh, confession is made. Or you, you will say with your mouth what you already have believed in your heart. And yeah, right here, it talks about accepting or receiving him in this way. So that is uh, what we get in verse uh, 11. He came to his own. His own did not receive him. Not all of them. That's speaking of the Jews. Here's what it says. But as many as received him, to them he gave them the right to become the children of God who believe in his name. Now, when John is writing this, again, it's the end of the, the first century, and by this time, the gospel has gone all throughout the Jewish world, but it has also gone all throughout the Gentile world. So he went to his own first. His own did not receive him. Paul talks about that. I am not ashamed of the gospel, Romans chapter 1, verse 16, because it is the power of God unto salvation. So that's it went first to the Jew and then to the Greeks or to the Gentiles. So again, the church is comprised of Jew and Gentile alike. When we read Peter, when we read John, when we read Paul or James or Jude or any of them, we're talking about Jewish men. And these were Jews who ended up believing in Jesus as Messiah. 
Now, the people that they would be writing to, in some cases, especially with Paul, almost primarily Gentiles. Though he would go to speak in the synagogues, he was writing to Gentile churches by and large, because he's in a Gentile part of the world as he's writing those things. So the important part of this is that anyone who believes, John understands by this time for 60 years, roughly, um, the Gentile world had begun to know about the person of Jesus, and by the end of this first century when he writes this, it's in full swing. So everyone in that part of the in that part of the world would have would have heard or had been available to them to hear. So to those that would hear and accept him, he gave them the ability to be called God's children. So that means that not all are God's children, which we hear all the time. So um, they are they are the creation of God, no question. But as far as his children, you're not born into that. You're born again into being a child of God. So it says, he came to his own, his own did not receive him, but as many as did receive him, to them he gave them the right to become the children of God, to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, but of, or, or of the will of man, but rather by the will of God. So then verse 14 says, and the word, this speaking of Jesus, he at one point in time, which we know, he became flesh, he dwelt among us. And what did we do? We beheld his glory, the glory is the only begotten of the Father, filled with grace and with truth. And so um, he goes on to say more about that. So go through and read the rest of that first chapter. Very, very interesting because it'll talk about John the Baptist a bit further. But for sake of where we're studying today, we look at what John has had to say in the gospel and look at how much it resembles what we see here also in these verses. Now, what I want to do... I want to read the first four verses of this, and if you need to, go back and flip through it or pause the video. Go back and flip through. When you hear something that I read here that sounds like what you just read in the gospel, go ahead and stop it and go between, because you're going to find out that what John is doing here is very much the same thing in the gospel as in this epistle. He's trying to make the same things, but you'll notice, once again, he speaks about that in a very clinical, academic kind of a way. It's still personal. There's no question about it. But he's not speaking about somebody that he doesn't know in either one of these places. He's speaking about the Jesus that he knows in both places, but it becomes personal here. In the first one, it's, it's as though he's just saying, here are the facts. It's not to win an argument. It's just telling you what was done in the first place. And John is an eyewitness, so he's a very credible representation of what was what was said and what was done. And his gospel is so different from the other three, the synoptic gospels of uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. John's is is set up differently because it's intended to to introduce to people the Jesus who is God in the eternal sense, but became flesh and dwelt among us. Now, as we transition to his epistle, he wants us to know that Jesus that I had established in the gospel as being the personal son of God who came and dwelt among us and did the things that he did. He's always been, he always will be, but for a time he limited himself to this creation. That's the gospel because he's going to spend the rest of that gospel talking about the things that Jesus did until he resurrected and then in a little bit of the, the time post-resurrection. But of course he focuses on his life. Now, in the gospel, or in this um, uh, epistle, rather, he shifts from it now that Jesus has gone to heaven and waits to assemble us to himself. In the meantime, here's what John wants us to know. Here is for those who believe, here is how we are to conduct ourselves. Again, his topic is going to be incredibly focused on loving God, him loving us. What is that love and how is it put into practice? And so he's going to explain that in vivid detail. There is this thing that is known as agape love, and God has shown it towards us, and we are to show it towards one another, and we are to actually return it to him as well. We are to love God as we love the rest of our brothers and sisters. So that is what John wants to make sure that we understand. So here, let's just read the first four verses of this real quick, and uh, it'll give us a chance to kind of start the whole, the whole process. Again, as I, write, as I read this, if this sounds familiar to what we just read in, in John's Gospel, stop and flip back between the two. 
because you're going to find some incredible similarities. What you'll notice is a difference of presentation. He presents it as though it is something that he's making the case for as an apologetic, as trying to say, here is why you need to understand who he is in his essence. John here wants to say, let's talk about him on a personal level, because that's why he came to be here, was that we could know him personally. So, John says, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and our hands have handled concerning the word of life. The life was manifested and we have seen, we bear witness and we declare it to you, eternal life, that eternal life, uh, which was with the Father and was manifested to us. That which we have seen, that which we have heard, we declare to you, that you also may have fellowship with us, and that truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son. And these things we write to you, that your joy may be full. What a mouthful. Now, what he does in the first two verses of this is to make sure that we understand who he is in the essential parts from an eyewitness who was there to hear him and to take in, in those three years that John spent with Jesus before the cross, everything that there is to be known about who he is. So um, John gives a very, uh, a very detailed description of his eyewitness testimony. Because let's remember, everybody that, uh, that Jesus called to himself in the apostles, when he, when he meant to, uh, went to meet them in Galilee as he did, he called them to follow him. Didn't make them do it, he gave it to them as an invitation. And so as he did this, John is able to say, the one that we came to know, that we believed in who he was enough that we left our lives as they were to follow him. Now, after all this time, and again, I find this such a, such a compelling thing for my heart when I think about this, and it's a good reason why we should believe. When it comes to a person like John, remember he's writing at the close of the first century, some 60 years on from the death and resurrection of Jesus. In 60 years, you have a long time to reflect back on everything that took place back when you were a young man. And if for some reason there was doubt in your mind, it certainly would have come out by now. In fact, if there was doubt in his mind, he wouldn't have written. But he writes in a way that it's not crisis to him. It's not even something that's in question. This is something that he is more convinced of now than ever because time has gone by. And I would really hope that each of us as believers can say this. From the moment that we got saved, are you more convinced of what it is that you believe than when you first believed? And has that been a trajectory that goes upwards from the time that you got saved? I had faith when I got saved. Jesus is who he said he is, and I agree that I need his forgiveness, and I know that he died in my place to forgive me of my sin. That's bottom line. That's, that's entry-level Christianity. That's where we all begin. The question is, what happens as we go down the road? And we learn, and we, we gain knowledge, we gain experience, we gain understanding, and we become students of the Word, hopefully. We watch a lot of the things that have taken place. We see what God does in, in His interaction with His people. And it's given us reason why we believe even more so then or now than we did back then. And I'm, I'm glad to say this. I'm, I'm so thankful to be able to say this. And, and it's not something that I make up, and it's nothing special about me. Um, but I can say in my 30... 38 years of being a believer, I can only say that from when I first got saved to now, my belief in him has increased because I've come to know him better and he's revealed himself more thoroughly through the years. Just time does that. And you, you'll, I'll be able to look back on him and say he's never failed. He's never not followed through with something that he has promised that he would do. It doesn't tell me my life's going to be easy or anyone else for that matter. But you'll notice that in verse 4, we've already read it, that he says, I'm writing these things to you that your joy would be full. Well, he mentions the word joy, which I can't wait to get to because it's different than being happy. And maybe the understanding of if we know what joy really is all about, then we should be able to look and say, circumstances are circumstances. That doesn't change the trajectory that we're going to see who he is. And in the meantime, whatever we may encounter in this earth is but temporary. Can't take away your joy. You can, you can take away your happiness it can take away your stability. It can take away your, your ease of life. It can take away all those things. But salvation is a matter of joy and not of happiness. It can lead to happiness, absolutely, no problem. 
but it is the matter of joy is a separate matter altogether in that it's something that can never be taken away from the believer no matter what happens to them they can be joyful in knowing that their salvation is settled in him and that uh, if they believe in, in what he has done and uh, have sought him for his forgiveness of their sin they are saved and that is an eternal matter cannot be taken away such an important thing to, for us to understand so let's look at the text the first two verses uh, that we have here in front of us is again Paul or not Paul but John doing very much like what he had done in the uh, in the gospel is giving this um, this presentation of the person Jesus but now it's rather than from teaching it as a professor or as an academic um, still one who knew him he's not he's not teaching about Jesus from a book he's an eyewitness to those things but he's giving it as an apologetic or as a defense for who Jesus is in his deity now he's going to do the same kind of imagery, basically saying, I'm an eyewitness to this, and I want you to know him as I know him. So, first of all, if he's going to make such statements, we would want to be able to ask, well, who are you that you would speak with any kind of authority on these matters? This is where he's able to do precisely that. So, that which was from the beginning, and when you see that, it just kind of makes it seem impersonal, as though he's talking about a concept rather than a person. And so more importantly, we want to understand when he says that which was from the beginning, you could say who was from the beginning. Jesus, the one who is there from the beginning. So the one who was or that which was from the beginning, the one or which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and our hands have handled concerning the word of life. So. There are a lot of things that he says there, but again, this sets it up where it helps us to understand he's talking about on a very personal, one-on-one -on -one level. He wants, it, it's as though he's speaking from his perspective as though we were sitting across the table from him. And really, it can be understood very much that same way, as though John wants very much for the person who is a believer at this point, because again, remember, he's, he's not trying to convert people. These are people who are referred to as dear children of his. So this is more, here's the reasons why we believe what we believe. And if there is any doubt in us, let's dispel the doubt. And if there's any wavering or concern about things, let's get them settled. And so he wants to set straight maybe some errors that might have been taking place, especially in this first chapter. He wants us to say, by the time we clear the first chapter, let's make sure that we're on level ground, all of us here. So what's the best way to do that? John can say, I'm an eyewitness to some things, so let me share with you what I know. Speaking of this Jesus who always has been, always will be, John can say, I am one of the eyewitnesses. In fact, he's the inner circle guy. He's Peter, James, and John. So he's the one who was there for all of those things. He was the one that, that was there at the cross when the rest of them had scattered. He was the one standing next to Mary that when Jesus looks to John, he says to her, to him, gives him charge of his mother. You know, look after her is basically, in my absence, look after her. That's a charge that he gave to him. John is referred to as the beloved. And so uh, it doesn't get any more inside than, than that. So uh, Peter gets a lot of publicity, so does Paul. But when it comes to John, read about the upper room things when they're there at the Last Supper and John's place of prominence and whatnot. It is astounding. So what we're reading here, it's an easy thing to, to lose track of because it's just words on a page. Um, I shouldn't say just words on a page. Because it is words on a page and we're not hearing it directly from him, it might be easy to sometimes lose, fact, lose sight of the fact that this is a man who spent three years at the feet of Jesus and knew him in a way that, that very few others could even come close to knowing him. You know, you, you have to think about the inner circle people. And his insight and the things that he knows, my goodness, they are, they're profound. And God has preserved his word for us these 2,000 years later, knowing full well that we would be reading them. So he's going to say something here that makes us just kind of sit back and go, pretty amazing. So he says this, speaking of Jesus, who was there from the beginning, it says, now we've heard him, we've seen him with our eyes, we've looked upon him. And our hands have handled. So let's look at each one of those on an individual way. When it says that we've heard him, there's the audible. And it's the, you know, we, we heard the things that he had to say. Physical voice, 
we were able to listen to what he taught, but it's not just regular hearing. It is obviously hearing with, with understanding as well, or else you're not going to speak about him in the way that John does. So for him to say, we can hear a lot of things in the course of a day, but how many things do we actually take to heart and make memory of them, let alone put them to, you know, uh, attaching them to a person? So John would say, like we hear everyone, we've heard him and there's something different about hearing him in that we heard him, but we heard with understanding. And so that was the beginning of these things. And then these other elements that are added in here will kind of encapsulate them all at the end. So it says, we heard him, and then it says, we have seen with our eyes. And then the next one he says, looked upon. It almost seems as though they're the same things. We've seen him. So this is more of the initial. When, when we laid eyes on him, we heard the things that he had to say. It's, it's not that we're hearing this secondhand. What John is again setting up here is firsthand witness here. So we heard the, th or we've seen him rather. I'm sorry, we heard the things that he had to say and we have beheld him. We've seen him in the physical sense. So think about a great way to kind of en envision this. Go back to the very beginning of him uh, meeting Jesus as an apostle or, or when Jesus first calls him. Go back to John's gospel and he'll give you all those details. So you lay eyes on Jesus, you hear the things that he has to say. But looked upon is a different word altogether because it says, from that primary time when we first saw him and heard him, then we looked upon him, meaning we took into account everything that he had to say. We took into account everything that he had ever delivered to us in the way of, of teaching, of mannerisms. Take it in. Everything that you would have seen in those three years is looking upon him. We've examined him. So his eyewitness is primarily we saw him, we heard him, and then we took a deeper look and we looked further into who he is. Now, after that, after he says we've looked upon him, we've taken, you know, we've gone further with this, and it says our hands have handled concerning the word of life, the logos of Zoe, and that's of the, in the eternal sense, that in Jesus who is, what do you want to know about God? Go talk to his son, the one who has spoken to us directly. What's God's desire for our life? Well, go see what Jesus has to say because you'll be able to hear in his own words God speaking to you. And in his speech and the things that he says will lead to eternal life. Those two things are absolutely inexorably attached. That eternal life is found in the Logos of God. Jesus Christ, the intention of everything God would ever want known or said, is found in him as a person and in him as life. Notice how similar that is to uh, what John says in his gospel, that that light was the light of men. Uh, uh, that life, rather, was the light of men. So it's the Jesus is the one who turns on the lights, if you will, helps us to see all of those things. And the, the prospect of eternal life is found only in and through him, his death and his resurrection, his blood being shed. Now, John doesn't need to go into all of that detail because these are people who know these things. This is said more in the way of reassurance. It's assuming all of those things. It's not that John doesn't know them. They're just already past that place of, of that initial place of belief. He's now giving reasons for belief and he's doing it as an eyewitness. So he ends up saying this, concerning, and that, that our hands have handled, this is John who would have been there in those, and, and let's make sure we understand the idea of handling means that he was a, a literal physical person. So yeah, when, when um, from the, the first time that they ever uh, met face to face, that time when Jesus called him to himself, all the way up through, if you can think about it, in the upper room when they were, when, when Jesus would be laying upon him. And uh, so the, 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 that physical, every single day, tangible we've touched him we've handled him it's it is if you think about it the culture of the time it was very demonstrative and it was very in a loving sense there was the embracing there was the kissing on the cheek there was the the fellowship that, that took place with that so he knows very very intimately what it is to be involved with jesus and the other disciples they shared their lives together for those three years but john also saw him post-resurrection 
as did the other disciples. In fact, more than once, and at the time uh, John would have been present when uh, when uh, James, I'm sorry, not James, but Timothy rather said, um, Thomas, gosh, third time's a charm, right? When Thomas says, hey, I hear what you guys are talking about this resurrection, but I won't believe it unless I can see him. <laughs> right on cue, Jesus shows up and says, so you want to see? Well, here's my side. Here's my hand. You know, go ahead and, and examine. Here's the hole in my hand from, would have been to the wrist. But here it is. There's the nail hole. Here's the spear. Go ahead and take a look at it. So they've handled him in that sense. Or when Jesus, as you, as you find in the last chapter of John's Gospel, when Jesus comes to them on the shores of Galilee, and uh, he has the discussion with Peter about loving them more than me, you know, these, these things. Do you love them more than me? Uh, John is there for that. So he was there to have breakfast with the Lord on the shores of Galilee after his resurrection. So very much real, very much physical, very much tangible. Um, and John's saying, I'm not telling you about somebody I read about in a book. I'm telling you about this. I'm telling you about the one who, when we first were introduced to him, we heard the things that he said. We were able to listen and view his life. We looked upon these things, and then we took it beyond just the initial to the secondary part of that, that for our lives, we came to know him in a personal sense, everything that he said, everything that he did, and we've actually handled him as a real life person before and after the resurrection. So if you just stop right there, you think, very credible witness, very credible person, to be able to say the things that he is going to be able to say. And by doing this, he's able to also say, so from this point on, don't think that I'm giving you philosophy. Don't think I'm putting my own personal spin on things. If I've been an eyewitness, heard and seen, and, and really delved into what he had to say, I'm passing along to you what he passed along to us. And whether it's direct quote, or it's just the principle of the things that are being taught, in either case, these are things that are known to him, so he's making them known to the rest of the people. So he's able to say, now, the life was manifested, the word became flesh and dwelt among us, John 1, 14. It was manifested, Jesus became flesh, and we have seen. And now you're going to notice that there's a repetition of these things, the idea of seeing and declaring and those types of things. So we have seen, and it says we also uh, bear witness and uh, we declare to you that eternal life, uh, which was with the Father and was then manifested to us. Now, the manifesting, once again, it, it means that there is a, um, uh, it's something that wasn't in view and it becomes something in view. It's shown to us. It is, it is brought to light. Jesus was brought to us and manifested. We saw him. If, if you want to make that, that he had a physical birth, that's fine. Manifested is that our eyes were open. Everything that we were to know about who he was became known to us. So not only was he manifested in a physical birth, but also let's just use two verses that, that uh, John uses in his gospel. The word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory as the only begotten of the Father. Wonderful. That's the, he's in the, in the human sense. Verse 17 says that, uh, that um, the law came through Moses, but grace and truth came through the person of Jesus Christ. Again, manifested in a person what it was to see grace and truth in addition to just a physical body. So the manifestation covers all of those things. <clears throat> so the life was manifested and we have seen, and it says we bear witness and, uh, and we then declare to you. Now, the, the uh, declaring is to give, uh, give an eyewitness, is to give an account. So when we say that this to, to declare is to give a report, but bearing witness is where we get the word martyr from. So it's a testimony. It doesn't mean that you have to die to be a martyr. That's just something that people are a martyr because they have staked out a, a particular position. <clears throat> and in this case, um, uh, it's a declaration. And so it's unfortunately because of the, the way that it's used currently, a person that dies for the sake of what they believe is referred to as a martyr. And that's not intended to be that kind of a thing. Paul, or John rather, is very much alive when he refers to himself as being a person doing the work of a martyr. It's a witness, a person who is giving a testimony and a proclaiming of these things. <clears throat> so we bear witness and then we declare to you, we give this report, we want to make known to you um, 
that uh, eternal life, which was with the Father and was then manifested to us. So eternal life found in the person of Jesus. Without him, there is no such thing as eternal life. Now, what he's done in those first two verses is to make sure that we understand, okay, John, what do you want to tell us? I want to tell you about Jesus. I want to tell you about that he came into this world and that uh, everything that, that could be known about God is found in him. And we know that because we've seen him. We've listened to the things that he said. We've really looked upon it with intensity. And we actually have seen him not only live, but to be put to death and then to resurrect again. We've handled him before and after the resurrection. Both things would have been understood here. So he said all of those things and that eternal life has been manifested. It's been shown to all mankind that those who would believe could, could know that they have eternal life. So he's given this firsthand witness. He's given, if you will, the credentials of how he can speak with authority on these matters. What does he want done with that? Why does he do all this? What's the importance? Well, we get that in verse 3. He says, now, that which we have seen, again, still speaking of Jesus, the, that we've heard and we declare, it's the same words about hearing and declaring that you saw in verse 2. Same thing, okay? Same words, same Greek, same everything else. So, that which we have seen and heard, the person that we've noticed, that we declare him to you, we want you to know who he is, that you also could have fellowship with us, and truly, our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. That's the, that is the payoff, if you will. So, the, uh, the uh, word for fellowship is koinonia, and this means to have communion. It means to have, uh, it means to have relationship, if you will. So, I, I mentioned um, at the opening of this how some people mock the idea of a personal relationship with God and uh, let alone with Jesus or, or with God through the person of Jesus, however they want to go ahead and mock it, here it is clearly said, <clears throat> from the person who was an eyewitness and as close to Jesus as any human has ever been, in proximity but in relationship, I want you to know, John says, I want you to know that the one with whom I have fellowship, and because I have fellowship with Jesus, I also by definition have fellowship with the Father who sent him. Jesus' work was to make sure that the Father was known to them. Read John chapter 17. Take your time reading through that. It's Jesus' prayer. And notice how much he talks about the relationship that Jesus the Son has with the Father. And because of that, and the work that he had done on earth, that we could also have with the Father ourselves. Not just with the apostles, but as we see, not only those, not only the disciples that you have given to me, Jesus says, but also those who will believe because of their testimony. We're reading the testimony of one of those people. So what Jesus says in John 17 is taking place right here, right now. As you hear my voice, we are reading the, the, the words from a person who was an eyewitness, and it's a fulfillment of what Jesus had asked right here, right now. You are a living example that God's word is being fulfilled right here, right now in your life as an individual, because we are reading the testimony and it is meant to bolster our faith. I hope that blows your mind because it should. So when he says this, speaking of Jesus, the, the which we have seen and we have heard, we declare him to you that you may have fellowship with us, being one of us. Now, as we think of the apostles, and again, some churches, they do so much to uh, to elevate humans to such a status that it, it, it takes them from being just ordinary people. And whether it's Mary or the saints, as some people will call them and whatever, they're put in a different category. And here, John, to the whosoevers, we don't even know who's being written to here other than he refers to them as little children. If we were to, to be there or if he was to, to just show up right here in front of us, would he look upon us as children? in the sense that, that he's a person in an elder, fatherly kind of a figure, and he's just putting down to us information, things and reasons why we should believe. Would he look to us as children, but not that we would look to him as some kind of authority, as a father type of a thing, where he has greater superiority to us in a spiritual sense, or instead that we would look to him as, hey, you've gone there long before we ever did. We look to you as a father in the faith kind of a thing, because we're more in our infancy compared to you. Now, I can definitely tell you that there are people that are in my life in the early years of being a believer that I look to as father figures in the faith, but now here I am 38 years later and I'm, I'm in their place with other people. And that cycle will continue. So it's not meant that he's in, 
there's some the, some other echelon and there's the the also rands in this they're just simply the ones that were there they have a unique place but they are still human nonetheless they were in the same need of salvation as every single human that has ever existed there is none no human being is ever able to be able to claim exclusivity that they are different from every other human that's ever existed except for Jesus. He's the only one who is different than every other human that has ever been. Even Mary, though some would try to say otherwise, needed a savior. She also was a person who had to offer for her own sins. We see her do that at the dedication of Jesus. So, you know, just the idea that we, we put these people on these pedestals that they're not intended to be on. So here John makes that very clear. I want you to have fellowship with us, and in doing so, let's remember we all have fellowship one with another in the Father. That's what he says right here at verse 3. So we write these things to you. We want you to know we've declared these things to you that you could have fellowship with us. And that fellowship is communion, that we have uh, you know, a, one, a, a oneness about us in being brothers and sisters in Jesus. This is what we desire. And so this is his reason for communicating these things to him. And notice this, that also our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. So clearly two separate personages that are being represented here, not like some would teach in uh, the, the, it, the, the, almost the slang term of it is Jesus only. The technical theological term is modalism and that God is really just one entity, and he basically wears a different hat. He's Jesus at some times, he's the Father at other times, and he's the Spirit at other times, but just kind of running around wearing different hats. Right here, there are separate, distinct personages. John makes that clear not only in his epistle, but in his gospel as well. So people can believe that all that they want to. They're just wrong, uh, and that's not because I'm smarter than they are. It's just a look at the text. You can't make the case for modalism in the text. It's just argued against from basic reading. And here's one of those examples. So John says, we have this fellowship with the Father and the Son. We want you to have fellowship with us as we have with them. And we are all going to be one as Jesus intended. Again, remember, John uh, understands this in great detail because he records for us the prayer of Jesus about this very same topic, John 17. So your homework for next week. <laughs> and I have no way of verifying whether or not you'll do your homework. Take the time to read John chapter 17. Take your time working through it. If you need to, get out a piece of paper and break it down. Look through it with all of the detail necessary. So it says, <clears throat> we want you to have the same fellowship that we have with you, with, that we can share together, because we have it with the Father and the Son. Jesus has secured that for us. And it says, now these things we write to you, that your joy may be full. Now, I love the, the uh, idea that we speak about joy here. Because joy and happiness, I, I mentioned that a little bit before, there's happiness as we think about it. Now, we also want to uh, remember that in the Beatitudes, it says, blessed are the, and then figure, you know, throw in the rest of them there from uh, Matthew chapter 7, 5 rather, Matthew chapter 5. And there you have the Beatitudes. And so it's, you know, blessed are the, and then you, you have like the poor in spirit, the meek, the, you know, all the rest of those, those who, those who mourn, all of those. Blessed means, oh, how happy, if you want the most, most straightforward into English kind of thing. But it's not a happiness that we find for ourselves or something that puts a smile on our face. That's not what it's about. These are spiritual endowments because we wouldn't know that we have a need for him. We wouldn't mourn for our sin and our need for forgiveness or any of the rest of them that are there if God does not, first of all, alert us to that and then give to us the blessing of, of meeting that need. So I don't want to spend too much time on that, but it's a, it's a fascinating thing. But it says, oh, how happy, and it's not just a simple emotion. It's a recognition of what God has actually done. But I can be happy about a number of things. I can be walking down the street and, and see, you know, see money sitting on the ground in front of me. I can be happy about that. Um, I can get a new car. I can be happy about that. I can, whatever the case may be, just some, whatever, just some example. I can be happy about that, but it can be taken away in a heartbeat. And so I love playing the, the idea with the car um, or the money that I find sitting on the ground. I could put it in my pocket, but I could reach into that pocket and pull out my keys and drop it right back on the ground. I'm not happy anymore because now it's gone. I can get the new car, but I can get in an accident on the way home. I'm not happy anymore. That's fleeting. It can, it can go away. Joy cannot be taken away. 
So again, if I drop the money out of my pocket or if I wreck my car, I'm still going to heaven. And if I understand that, joy ensues, even though I'm really unhappy about any particular thing that's taking place at any particular time. When we make this much more personal and much more serious, we can lose somebody very close to us and they can pass from this life. Now, if they're believers, I can have joy knowing that they have gone and seen their Savior face to face and that I will be joining them at some point down the road and that I have that as a promise. That person that I loved and cared for and had great, you know, uh, great love for them, I will see them again if they were believers and, and because I'm a believer and I have the promises that they did, I'll see them again and I can have joy in the midst of unimaginable grief. So joy and happiness are two entirely different things. So he says, I've, I've taken the time to write these things down and let's make sure that we don't miss this. It's such an important part. The writing of this, it was written with the intention that as long as God would have man here, it wouldn't be something that John would have just said to them verbally, but he's taken the time to write those things out so that there is a permanent record for those who would follow after. So let's remember the things that we're reading here are as important to us right here and right now as they were to his original, uh, his original uh, recipients some 1900 plus years ago. That's a significant thing when you stop to think about it. How serious a matter is that? That God said, and of course you didn't say that, this is what, what he would be, I guess you could say what he, the thought process behind it. John, I want you to write this directly to the people who will be the recipients of it. You can't see this, nor can you know it now, but these words will be preserved for the ages and for the generations that follow, that they can have the same assurance and comfort and peace that you have given these people that are the first recipients. So when it says here, I've written these things down, that your joy may be full. So that means brought to completion or brought to a fullness, which is, again, incredibly comforting to the heart that says, you know, I might, I might have things in this world that just are not, they're not going to, quote, make me happy. But that's fine. Happiness is a fleeting thing. Joy is a permanent kind of a thing. And he writes these things down so that no matter what might happen to us in this life, they can take away our, our, our good feelings, our happiness, whatever you want to call them, but never be able to take away our joy because joy is rooted and founded in things that are not emotional. They are not things that could be taken away at any moment. They're not things that come or go. Joy is something that is permanent, it is fixed, and it is something that cannot fade away because it's intended to focus us on the eternal of things. I have joy in my relationship with the Lord and I will be united to Him at some point down the road. That brings joy. I can have happiness about that as well. It can make me really happy, but joy is something that is on a different plane entirely. And God has had this preserved for not only these people, written down, so that it couldn't be forgotten or misquoted or misunderstood or just absent. It's there as a permanent record for anyone who would read this and that they could have their joy brought to completion or to fullness. So the first four verses, again, it's important that we understand, I want to give you my eyewitness, verses one and two. And the intention of my eyewitness is that you will come to know Jesus and have fellowship with us as we have fellowship with the Father and the Son. And that knowing that and having it something that you can have at your fingertips at all time, uh, at all times, that if you ever run into a place where you're questioning things that he's going to cover, you can go back to this written record and have your joy made full and uh, stay in that place, not having it go up and down. It's not something that should be running out or exhausted. It's just if ever there's something that makes you uh, in, in any way struggle, go back to this and, and you can be reminded of it. And then he'll have plenty of things to say about our relationship with the Lord. Yeah, we should have a walk with him that reflects who he is and who we are in him. Very, very important that we understand that too. So we'll pick up at verse 5 and just kind of pick right back up where we left off today. Because again, it's one continual thought. He wants to start talking about our fellowship, going back to this fellowship that we have with him. What's the evidence of that? Do we walk in fellowship with him? Do we walk in the light as he is in the light? And if we do, there's benefit to it. If we fail, there's a, there's a backup for that as well. And just some wonderful things that are said here. And so we'll pick up at verse 5 next week as we start to work our way through this book. So uh, if you have any questions on anything that's been shared, contact me through the ministry website, which is oldpaththeology.net. 
and there's an email uh, um, drop down there. You can send me an email. I'll be happy to uh, answer any questions you might have on that. And uh, we will pick up next Thursday at verse 5.